Hello and welcome to Sounding Board, a community access television production of Seroptimus International of Novato. My name is Madeline Peters and I am interviewing our guest today, Bronwyn Harris, who is an author of a lovely book, Literally Unbelievable, Stories from an East to Oakland Classroom. But before I introduce Bronwyn, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about our organization, Seroptimus International. The mission of Seroptimus is improving the lives of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic empowerment. So then, thank you very much, Bronwyn. I know we've been communicating for, for quite some me. time. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be here and to talk about your experience. I, I, this is an opportunity for people to tell their story. And I found your story very compelling, so I'm glad to have you here. I'm very and glad to be here. Be thank part you. of Seroptimus, uh, our sounding board program. So anyway, so why don't I just kind of have you set the context a little bit about your background um, uh, for our viewing public. Sure. I grew up in Petaluma, which if you don't know is a little um, suburban town. It's growing. but um, And I went to UC Davis, and then I got my teaching credential at Sacramento State. And at some point during my teaching credential program, I decided I wanted to work in Oakland. And I can't really pinpoint what <laughs> led me to that decision. Most of my professors thought it was a terrible decision and were not shy about telling me. Um, but I decided to do it, and I got my teaching credential in December 1999. And in January 2000, I was looking for a teaching job in Oakland Unified School District. So there you go. You were a local person, mm -hmm. grew up in uh, the greater uh, San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. and your education locally, and then you are um, looking for a teaching job, and you're in the Oakland Unified School District. So one of the things in prepping for this uh, talk, I asked you to identify some points that you wanted to make, and so why don't I have you talk about your um, initial experience when you stepped into the classroom? Sure. And so um, if you think about the school year, finding a job in January, there aren't a lot of options. That's true. So um, I actually took over from a teacher who had left. I found out later he had left because he started getting panic attacks every time he start, saw the school. Uh, they didn't tell me that when I came. And the, the class, which was first grade, had had six substitutes in, in between. In, in the year? Or in the year. He left in October, and between October and Christmas vacation, they had six substitutes. So here you are, you're a brand new teacher, mm -hmm. newly minted in December. 24 years old. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you're stepping into a classroom mm -hmm. where the teacher left with panic attacks, and there just been a rotating right. series of teachers since then. Yes, so. I, I walked into the classroom on the first day, and a child threw a book at my head and said, we don't need no more teachers. Uh -huh. And that was my introduction to teaching. So this is where I think you t talked about this as culture shock. Yes, uh -huh. it was definitely culture shock. Okay. And so that was your arrival story to the school district. So how did you feel, mm -hmm. at, you know, right at that time? I felt completely unprepared. Nothing in my teaching credential program had prepared me for this. Um, exhausted, most of the time overwhelmed. And I quickly learned that all the other teachers at the school were also overwhelmed, so there wasn't anyone to help me out. And then it was also interesting in the, sort of a sociological um, thing. I had never been the only white person in a room before. I had never experienced what being a minority was like. And the part of Oakland where I was teaching, I was definitely the minority. So this was a completely new experience for you. Mm -hmm. And here you were in part of a state teacher credential program with the idea that a teaching credential equips you to teach at any public school mm -hmm. anywhere in the state of California. But there are obviously uh, significant differences between your experience in teaching and your actual first teaching job. Absolutely. And so one of the things that, and I'd like to talk about my, um, my interest in having you come here is uh, you're, you published this book, Literally Unbelievable. And uh, I'm a professor of education at a local school and mm -hmm. uh, in, in teacher education. And I remember finding this information, and I was just mesmerized by your story. It really had an impact on me, and I thought I wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to have a larger conversation with you. So here you are now telling me about this culture shock experience that you are looking at really kind of not just being a new teacher, but really facing um, who you are and what your experience mm -hmm. has been 
uh, trying to kind of navigate schooling in East Oakland. Yes, and um, I'd like to read a section if that's okay. I would okay. love that. Oh, yes. Um, this, this section sort of sums up uh, some of the culture shock I felt because okay. I had come in with a certain set of expectations, you know, of what it was like to be a child. Um, you had a home, you ate three meals a day, you went to school, you were expected to graduate from high school, and those were the kids I was prepared to teach, and this is what I came into. Okay, so, let me hear. I have a tendency, like many people, to overuse the word need. I say I need the new iPhone or I need a pedicure, even though those are clearly things I just want. My greatest lesson on distinguishing between wants and needs came with my first grade class during my first year of teaching. Volunteers from the business world came to our school through the Junior Achievement Program to teach for a day. As a new teacher, I was totally overwhelmed and relieved to not be responsible for lesson plans for even one day. However, I was nervous about how an idealistic business person would deal with 20 extremely needy first graders living in one of the most violent parts of Oakland. The woman who showed up at my class was clearly unnerved to be in this particular neighborhood. When she walked in, she was shaking slightly and she stammered the first few times the kids asked her a question. But she collected herself quickly enough and taught in an enthusiastic and respectful manner. She went over the official junior achievement curriculum which included basic map skills and identifying the different parts of a city. Then she got to needs versus wants. I don't remember exactly how it fit into the lesson as a whole, but I can still picture the images she used. Cutouts of an ice cream cone, roller skates, a house, a plate of food, a t-shirt, etc. The class was supposed to vote on whether each item was a need or a want and the picture was then taped to that side of the board. For some of the items, there was clear consensus. Everyone agreed that while roller skates and bicycles were nice to have, they were definitely not necessities. So those items went on the wants side of the board. Others required some explanation. Ice cream was supposed to be a want, as it's a treat, but the plate of food represented food as a whole, which went under needs. The businesswoman seemed happy with the class discussion and the decisions the kids were making as a group, right up until she got to the picture of the house. The class collectively decided that it belonged on the wants side. The guest teacher looked confused and then clarified that this image included apartments also, which was quick thinking on her part. But the kids were still not sold. That's a want, many insisted. The woman looked at her notes and clarified that it was supposed to be a need. People need homes. One six-year-old saw her confusion and helpfully jumped in with an explanation. My uncle don't have a home, she said, and he's still alive. Other kids started jumping in. My friend lives in a shelter. She don't have a home. Some of my family members are homeless. My mama used to live on the street, but when she had kids, she moved to my auntie's house. One after another, at least half the class shared their anecdotes about homelessness, and they all agreed, homes are a want. My guest was taken aback. This had not fit into the cookie cutter script she'd been given. These kids were young enough that most of them were not fully aware of how shameful mainstream society considers homelessness to be. They definitely didn't like it, but for them, it was a normal part of life. After school that day, the guest teacher stayed to talk to me and began to cry. She said she had never thought about this kind of poverty existing in the Bay Area. She pointed out that none of the students looked homeless as they were all clean and wearing nice clothes. She was also confused why I hadn't corrected them. She thought they should know that homes were a need. I didn't agree though. I thought the kids had a good point. That's very compelling. It was only one of the many, many culture shocks I ex mm -hmm. experienced. So in telling this story, because obviously this story made it into your book, mm -hmm. uh, and it, I, as you said, there were many stories. What, was what does this story particularly highlight for you? 
It really highlighted to me how much uh, invisible need there is because the kids, the, the woman was right, the kids didn't look homeless. Mm -hmm. um, what she was expecting and what I was expecting, I think, is if someone was homeless, they were sleeping on the street. They were in a tent encampment, something like that. And there's so many different ways that kids are homeless. You know, I've had kids who lived in shelters, kids who, you know, just couch hopped between different um, relatives' houses. You know, there, there's just, we don't see that. And since it's shameful, at a certain age, the kids learn to hide it and then there's no way to help them. And then you see kids missing school because they couldn't wash their clothes or they didn't have a ride to school from where they were now staying. Right, and mm -hmm. as you said, well, the couch hopping, you know, then you don't know how far from school they are. Right. What it takes, so as you said, certain types of homelessness are invisible. Exactly. And, and I think what you bring up is a good point. We need to be understanding that because mm -hmm. things are not, um, seen so easily with markers indicating homelessness or other types of conditions. Right. You can't always see, you can't see when a child's hungry. Right. You can't right. see when they've witnessed violence. Uh -huh. This was all part of your um, immense learning and mm -hmm. your in inauguration as a teaching. Right. <laughs> so then let's kind of, um, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to also ask is what did you learn about yourself, you know, I do, in, in terms of your initial experience. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about white privilege. I learned a lot about um, the fact that I had assumed my whole life that white people were the default. Other people had labels. If you just talk about a person, you know they're white. Mm -hmm. um, this was not true here. This was um, my first year of teaching. I was teaching first grade, six-year-olds. You know, they're really little. They say whatever's on their mind. We were teaching about Martin Luther King, and I was a brand new teacher, and I was really struggling. And I said something, you know, like very, very, um, you know, superficial, like before Martin Luther King, black kids and white kids couldn't go to school together, you know. And a kid said, "Teacher, what are you talking about?" She said, "Black kids and white kids don't ever go to school together because they had never." And then another kid piped up and said, "I don't think there are white kids. There are three kinds of kids: there are black kids, Mexican kids, Chinese kids." And then all the Vietnamese kids in the class got really upset. Don't call us Chinese. But what it showed me was this was, I had never had to be the minority. I had never had to think about that all the people in the room looked different than me, that maybe they were judging me based on my race. And it's exhausting, as I'm sure any person who's not white can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and the kids just had a completely different conception. They actually had a really interesting conversation about if there are white kids, because there are white teachers, so white teachers have to come from somewhere, so there must be white kids, but they had never seen it. So as I, I had sort of, you know, thought that racism was this thing that happened in the past and, you know, everything's fine now. And I started taking these groups of all black and Latino kids or all black, Latino and Asian kids on field trips and buses would pass us up one after another. So you really experienced, as the teacher of these students, you really experienced what they experienced as part of, your students experienced as part of their everyday life. Exactly. And I started to learn that everybody has an implicit bias. And I had never had to think about that before. Mm -hmm. And as a white teacher, I definitely had an implicit bias. And um, I think the most powerful moment was in my second year of teaching, I was working with a, a young man who um, was very angry for a lot of reasons. He was an African-American boy. And we had been working on his anger. We had been um, you know, using different techniques to calm him down and having him write about his feelings. And his mother was great, and she was on board with all of this. And I wrote down in the comment section of his report card, you know, I wrote his name and I said, has been very angry this year, but we're working on it, something like that. And his mother taught me a really valuable lesson. She came in and she was so kind and she was so patient with me. I was 25, you know, mm -hmm. and she said, Miss Harris, I don't think you understand what it means to label a black boy as angry. This piece of paper is gonna follow him in his folder through 12th grade and teachers are going to read it and they're going to have a preconceived notion of what he's like. And I can't tell you how many times my son has been labeled angry, defiant, aggressive, and those are labels that we don't give to girls and we don't give to white kids nearly as much. And she said, please, can you change that? And you know, for the first second, my knee-jerk reaction was to just to be very defensive, defend, defend myself and say, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. This isn't a race thing, I'm just telling the truth. And something in me in that moment made me be quiet and listen to her and change that. And that 
was the beginning, I think, of being able to just a little bit see how my white privilege can affect other people. Well, and your power, your power and influence exactly. has a huge impact. And she was, as you said, very kind to she, try to point exactly. that out. So she was uh, instrumental in kind of extending your thinking or having you look differently mm -hmm. at this particular situation. And she obviously had a lot of respect for you, too. I'm really grateful she approached it in a way where I could not be defensive, you know, where I could let that down. Right. Because, the, of course, the power dynamic in a school in a very low income area, the power dynamic always goes to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And she was standing up for her son in a way I could hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, too, it's not as though the school community had um, any other place to go to, because you told me in our early conversation there was no PTA. Right, so the interesting thing about my school, Oakland is a very, very segregated district and a very segregated city. Mm -hmm. And if you give me a map of Oakland and you just point to a place, I can tell you what the, you know, with pretty good accuracy what the ethnicity and socioeconomic status is. Mm -hmm. You know, above 580, um, you have the Hills schools and they're wonderful. They're easily as good as many private schools, a lot of times better. Um, they can have fundraisers, and of course every public school is still needy in a lot of ways, but they can have fundraisers where they can raise tens of thousands of dollars easily at a silent auction. I was teaching in what we call the Flatlands, which are mostly below 880, almost 100% minority. We call them majority minority schools, but my school was 100% minority um, the whole time I was teaching, except for two Bosnian refugees who came. They were the only white kids we ever had in our school and they left as fast as they could. Um, so we'd try to get parents together, and part of the problem was we had a really high turnover of principals and teachers. So there wasn't a lot of relationship building with parents. But then if you think about it, the parents who serve on PTA are ones who often come from a two-parent family because one parent can take care of the kids while the other parents at the meetings. They often come from a more uh, higher socioeconomic level because they have the time to volunteer. They're not working two or three jobs to try to make rent. Um, the parents I worked with very often were working two or three full-time jobs. They were often single parent families. They often didn't have transportation and that part of Oakland it's not safe to walk at night. Many of them didn't speak English. Many of them were afraid um, of being deported and many of them had had really bad experiences in their own schooling and they didn't want to go back to the school. Right. Right. There was no real bridge, right? a positive bridge to school. School was not a positive experience. Exactly. So no way to make that connection again. Mm -hmm. Now, you also talked about um, the schools uh, being where kids are set up to fail. And I want to make sure mm -hmm. there's a, several things, that you, quite a few things you talked about, but I want to make sure we, um, uh, I give you a chance to talk about that. So if you could address that. It, the, I mean, the situation that you describe is really... A complex in and of itself. And now then the structure of the school itself, if you could sure. comment on that. So the district is really, has never been equipped to deal with these two, you know, polar opposites. Um, and uh, they're always very slow to respond to um, any of the requests at our school because there weren't parents threatening lawsuits. You know, there weren't mm -hmm. parents pushing that. They, there weren't people advocating for the children. In my almost eight years teaching, um, I went through five superintendents, eight principals, and about 200 teachers because the turnover was so high. It was such a hard place to work. And without consistent leadership, you can't get anywhere. That's true. Um, you just can't. And we had principals, um, some of whom really tried, some of whom were clearly sent there as because they had been let go from other areas. And um, this was during No Child Left Behind. It was during the height of No Child Left Behind. I started teaching two weeks before George W. Bush was inaugurated. And um, No Child Left Behind punished schools very quickly who didn't, that didn't do well on standardized tests. And if you think about it, you're comparing kids at my school who weren't eating, who were only eating the school lunch, that might have been their only food for the day, who didn't have homes, who didn't have a quiet place to do homework, who didn't have parents who spoke English who could help them. Um, you were testing those kids against kids who had everything they needed and who had um, extracurricular activities and tutors and enrichment. And um, No Child Left Behind was a very, it was a proficiency um, test. It was not growth. And the difference, very quickly, is um, 
And if you follow politics, you may have seen Al Senator Al Franken trying to explain this to our new Secretary of Education, um, is that in growth, for example, if I'm teaching a fifth grade class, if I have a child come in who's reading at a kindergarten level, which happens, mm -hmm. and I get that child, we work really hard all year, and that child gets up to a fourth grade level, under proficiency tests, they are still seen as a failure because they're not at fifth grade level. It doesn't matter that they they're jumped grown, four. Yeah. Exactly. Um, growth would measure the growth. Mm -hmm. And so what we were told constantly by administrators was you only focus on the children who are right below grade level or at grade level to keep them there. You ignore the really high achieving children and you ignore the far below basic children because what we need to do is keep our school open. And I would say, but these kids don't know how to read. I'm teaching third grade and I have kids who don't know their letters. I need to focus on them and they would say no. You can do that after the school stays open. So this is life and death for the school. Mm -hmm. Either the school st stays open and you play that game. Right. Or the school is shut down. Exactly. And these kids have no, uh, so, no resources. Mm -hmm. So the kids who needed the absolute most help, they weren't getting it because they wouldn't help our test scores. Right. There's another point that you, you know, I wanted to make sure that you um, made. And uh, as with all these programs, we never have enough time. And that's the amount of trauma. So if you could comment briefly on the sure. kinds of what these children come to school with. Sure. So I had kids in my, in my class who had seen parents murdered, who had literally seen their parents killed, who came to school the next day because there was nowhere else for them to go. And we didn't have, a, we didn't have any resources for them. We didn't have counseling. I was just doing my best during the school day to you know, talk to them when they needed it. I had um, kids who had seen drive-by shootings, um, kids whose you know, relatives were in prison, um, kids who watched, seen domestic violence. Um, you know, it's, it's not unlike kids living in a war zone. And in fact, the police, I found out later, called our, the intersection where our school was, they called that the um, killing zone because it was the highest murder rate. It was the most violent section of, of Oakland. And we expected these kids to come to school and to be quiet and to listen and to learn everything just like any other kid. And you know, research everywhere shows that traumatized people cannot right. learn as well. Right. And there were no resources. And some of these kids have gone on to prison. Some of them have been killed. Some of them have killed other people. And I really, truly believe that if we had dealt with this kind of trauma when they were younger, we would not have so many problems. So it's a whole matter of having to rethink who, who is it that we are serving in these schools and what are the resources we need. Exactly. We are just about out of time. We have a few more minutes left. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I mean, you've touched on some very profound um, things and your, your experience. What is one thing that you'd like to leave uh, with our viewing audience about your experience? And I'd like message? to tell you about the feelings papers I made. And I can read just a very brief section because sure. I know time is running out. So I'll, I'll sort of summarize the first part, which is um, the best principal I ever had told us that um, don't ever ask a child why they're acting the way they are unless you want to know the answer. Because some children have seen a lot and that there's a reason. And I came up with um, this tool where the kids could fill out, there was a paper with, that had different feelings and they could check off what they were feeling and they could give it to me. And you know, I hoped it was a way that they could acknowledge their feelings, know someone else acknowledged it and we could work through things because learning is not separate from emotions. So I'm going to read just the very um, end of this. This is all in my book, of course, <laughs> um, which can be bought at my website um, or on Amazon. So they would give me these feelings papers and, um, well, I'll just start here. Some kids were less able to cope with feelings than others. These students would alternate between crying, raging, and blaming themselves. I learned to sit with them when I could and say, it's okay right now. You're okay right now. I know you feel bad, but you're okay. We're going to do this together. Those words were all I had to dole out to kids who had seen some horrible things or had people leave them who shouldn't have left them or who just hated themselves. At those times, all I could do was hug them and say, you're okay right now. I'm taking care of you right now and you're okay. I think the most I could give them was a feeling of being all right just for that one minute. It was inadequate, but I hope it was better than nothing. 
These papers didn't solve any of the problems in my students' lives. They still had parents who were incarcerated, they still witnessed and suffered abuse, and they still experienced the tragedies that come with living in a low-income, high-violence areas. But the act of identifying their feelings and having them validated was a tool that helped them take control over their emotions. As a result, they were less at the mercy of their feelings and more able to determine what they needed. At the very least, my goal was that, as they got older, they would remember that their feelings were always valid and that someone along the way cared about helping them figure that out. And at least these students had you to take that time to care. We are now out of time, Bronwyn. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. This was a very um, touching interview with you. Uh, thank you to our viewership. This is a Sounding Board, a television production of Seroptimus International of Novato. Again, my guest today is Bronwyn Harris, author of Literally Unbelievable. Thank you very much to Novato Community Television and the crew, Marcus Oaken, for being our camera person, to the executive director, Pam Hazley, and to Seroptimus members who serve a in support of this program. Thank you to Carol Bennett. My name is Madeline Peters and today's program has been truly, literally unbelievable. <laughs>